thank you. Uh, welcome, distinguished guests. I've not been in Aspen before, but even in the short time here, I can tell it's a very special place with very special people, and it's a, it's a privilege to be here. Also, it's a privilege to be in this amazing event, this Leonardo Extravaganza. Um, I've not seen anything quite like it before, um, with uh, Walter Isaacson and Simonessa Brandolini as the geniuses of the place. Um, this seems to me rather like the sort of Super Bowl of Leonardo studies, it's, um, it is, it, with all the with the exhibitions and so on. No, I've I've been around the world doing Leonardo things and been at some pretty extraordinary events and places, but this one will undoubtedly live in the memory. So, um, thank you both for setting it up, and thank the organising team: Jamie Miller, who you just heard, Peter Kaplan. Deborah Murphy, Ryan Zinger is in charge of the visual, audio visuals. It's always risky thanking the man uh, who's doing the audio visuals before they go belly up. But anyway, um, thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, Russ and I, who happen to live probably about a quarter, half a mile apart, yep, we've devoted some thought as to how to provide you with a framework. We did think of a kind of tag team discussion, but we're, we're looking to lay down a framework and the way we're doing this and it, uh, is with sequential presentations. Ross will come first and we'll look at Leonardo's life in relation to the works of art. The works of art are probably what you're most familiar with, so that's the establishing of the framework. I will then look at the science and technology. Um, I'll look at landmarks, not necessarily in a very chronological way, but above all looking at how it stitches into Leonardo's other pursuits. Um, we get hung up on the term artist-scientist, or art and science. Um, scientist is a 19th century term, so Leonardo as a scientist is already a pretty anachronistic thing to be talking about. And one of the concerns of my scholarship over the years has been to put Leonardo together again and to get at the core of what his thinking was and is, and to give some sense of an underlying unity at the heart of his work, so that science isn't science, art isn't art, they're both in absolutely integrally related things. So that's how we're going to set it up, and uh, Ross begins. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Is this working? No. Ah, oh, perfect, good. I thought I preferred this one. I feel more like a rock star with a microphone like this. Um, what I'm going to do is talk for 20 minutes or so, and I'm going to take my watch off and keep an eye on it, and the placard is going to arrive ominously after about 20 minutes, uh, warning me to come off the stage, and then the band will strike up, I gather, and, um, and, and drown me out. Anyway, what I want to do initially is just uh, talk a little bit about uh, Leonardo's biography, some of which uh, Walter, or a fair bit of which Walter talked about last night as well. But I just want to run over some of the key points and, and contextualize his paintings and his creative work in terms not just of his biographical details, but also in terms of uh, the, the context that he grew up in, the Florence of the 15th century, the Milan of the 15th century and early 16th. So as I think we know, he was born in April 1452 in uh, the small, uh, what was called by his first biographer, Paolo Jovio, a man who knew him, what was called an insignificant hamlet. Um, it had about maybe 350, 400 people by the time that he was born. And just to put uh, 1452 into context, um, Filippo Brunelleschi, the great architect, had died in 1446, so six years before uh, Leonardo da Vinci was born. Donatello, the contemporary of Brunelleschi, the great sculptor, was around 70 years old at that time. And in the other big two of the high Renaissance, high Renaissance, um, as it used to be called, um, Michelangelo and Raphael were, of course, not born at that time. Michelangelo would be born in 1475, uh, so he was over 20 years younger uh, than uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and Raphael was born in 1483. And so he really was the next generation, considerably younger. Both of them, of course, knew, came to know 
uh, Leonardo and Bill Wallace is going to talk about some of those relationships a bit later. Much closer in age to Leonardo da Vinci is someone that all of you know, Sandro Botticelli, who was seven years older. He was born in 1445. So, Leonardo, born illegitimately, was raised in the house of his grandfather. His father was a bit of an absentee father for uh, the first part of his life because of the fact that he was establishing his notarial practice primarily in Florence. Um, and by the time, by the late 1460s, he, Sir Piero, had more or less established himself in the city and was living there full time. Uh, and Leonardo then moved there around that time. No one's sure exactly when, but it was in all likelihood in the second half of the 1460s when he was an adolescent. Uh, the classic thing for you to do if you're becoming a painter was to begin your apprenticeship at 13 or 14. And if Leonardo followed that pattern, he probably would have come to Florence in about 1466. And Florence at that time um, was the um, a kind of intellectual and um, uh, artistic melting pot. It was uh, the, this cradle of the of 15th century culture. It had, in the 1460s, a population of about 40 or 50,000 people. And it was very wealthy, based primarily on wool, the wool industry, and also on banking. It was also a bit of a mini empire because it ruled over 400 walled cities, primarily in the Tuscan countryside. And of course, it had been ruled uh, really for the previous 30 years, um, even though nominally it was a republic, it was ruled by the Medici family. Cosimo de' Medici, who was really the founder of the political dynasty in Florence, died in the summer of 1464, probably just a year or two uh, before Leonardo arrived in town. Now, F Florence, the Florentines had a wonderful sense of self-confidence and of their place in the world and in history. And around the time of Cosimo's death, around the time of Leonardo's arrival there, a poet named Ugolino Varino wrote a poem called Fiametta, in which he described the wonders of living in Florence in the 1450s and 1460s. He talked about how, I was, I'm delighted to have been born at this fortunate time. Nowadays, we see innumerable arts flourishing, which have been absent from Italy for 10 centuries. So already we see here in this poem of 1464, the idea of a rebirth, that the arts are being rediscovered here in Florence. He says, now a new Phidias, and Phidias, of course, being the, the great Greek sculptor who did the statue of Zeus at Olympia, statue of Athena in the Parthenon, etc., responsible for the decoration of the Parthian, one of the most famous sculptors in history. A new Phidias is among us, uh, Verino claims, and a new Apelles, making reference to the great Greek painter, a new Apelles too, whose paintings seem to be alive. And it's interesting to speculate who is he talking about? Who is this great sculptor? Who is the great painter that he's referring to in the 1460s? And he concludes this by saying, may I say it without offending you, O men of ancient times, the golden age is inferior to the time in which we now live. As we see already, the Florentines are comparing themselves to the ancient Greeks in terms of their artistic prowess. And they're measuring themselves against the greatest of all time. And so as I say, it's interesting to speculate who the new Phidias is. Who was this great sculptor? He's possibly referring to Donatello, who, as I said, um, uh, uh, was a, a much older contemporary of Leonardo da Vinci. He died at the end of 1466, so he was alive uh, when Verino was writing. But he may have been referring to someone else who was really just beginning his career at this point and starting to make a name for himself. And that, of course, was Andrea del Vrocchio, the man with whom, into whose shop, Leonardo da Vinci went to work. Um, and Leonardo could not really have found a better master than Verrocchio. He was a goldsmith, and if you were a goldsmith um, in the 15th century, um, you were really a designer. You could work in any material. Many goldsmiths ultimately became architects. Um, and so Verrocchio, for example, worked in marble, he worked in bronze, he worked in terracotta. He also did a lot of metalwork, um, and also he did painting as well. And so Leonardo would have learned a lot of these things from him uh, when uh, he arrived in Florence as a young adolescent. And I like to think of Leonardo as the country boy from Vinci, who at age 14 comes to the big city. 
this, uh, this place that is the locus of creativity and is introduced by Verrocchio, to, uh, introduced into this world because Verrocchio loved music. Um, inventories of his house show that he owned musical instruments. He loved mathematics and he used mathematics and geometry in his works of art. For example, in the tomb he did for Cosimo de' Medici. Um, he, was one of the, he was the Medici sculptor of choice at this point. And I think it's interesting that Leonardo must have had his, the scales fall from his eyes at this point and realized that I mean, he would just have studied in Vinci at an abacus school where he would have learned the, the sort of mathematics that was germane to the career of a, a merchant, um, so, uh, how to barter, etc. And then suddenly arriving in Florence, studying with Verrocchio, he realizes that mathematics is something that can describe the universe, describe the visible world, and it's also something that can factor into paintings. And so I think um, he uh, would have been extremely excited by this. Uh, now, poor Verrocchio um, suffers from having such a great student. Uh, because one of the favorite pastimes of art historians and tourists is looking at Verrocchio's works of art and Leonardo's spotting, trying to figure out what Leonardo did in it. And sadly for Verrocchio, um, it, all, anything that is seen as, as um, exemplary and surpassing in Verrocchio's works of art is often attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. And people say, uh, Le Leonardo must have done this. I think it certainly is the case because the tradition is a very long one that he painted that blonde and angel on the left with the curls. Um, and Walter referred to the story um, last night and supposedly Verrocchio looked at that and never touched paints again because this uh, adolescent, as Vasari called him, had surpassed him. But if you look at the dates of that, Leonardo was in his early 20s then. And I ask you, is that the best part of the painting? Is that angel the best part? Or is rather the structural members of the body of Christ, the, the anatomy that we see of St. John the Baptist doing the baptism, those are pretty decent, I think. And so I'm not sure that Leonardo, Leonardo certainly would have worked on this, but he would have been learning from Verrocchio as much as surpassing him. And incidentally, Verrocchio did do paintings after this. So that story, um, on that point at least, um, is simply um, incorrect. One of the other things he did with Verrocchio, I said as a goldsmith, you did all sorts of work. And one of the things that Verrocchio did in 1471 uh, was what would have been a spectacular feat. It would have been a great spectator sport in Florence in May of 1471 when he put the two-ton copper ball on top of the lantern of Brunelleschi's dome, effectively finishing this famous dome, putting the finishing touch on it. And it's almost certain that Leonardo da Vinci was involved um, at the age of 19 with the um, possibly with the casting of it, because he makes reference in about 1515 to how that copper ball was soldered. So he was certainly on site watching that being done. And I think we'd have to imagine he was probably up on top of the lantern at that point, almost 300 feet in the air, um, as the, it was being lowered into place in front of, I'm sure, all of the people of Florence who came out to see this. Um, and we know that Leonardo was fascinated by it because he, the Brunelleschi's machines, which were in the workshop of the cathedral, uh, were used in order to do it. Um, and um, uh, Leonardo made drawings of them. And so we can see right here his interest suddenly in engineering, spectacular engineering pro projects, and also the minutia of the gearing that went into creating these wonderful machines. Just a, a final thing I'll say about his uh, work with Verrocchio is that um, it's now thought, David Allen Brown in uh, Washington, D.C. has, I think, persuasively argued, based on evidence from a great Verrocchio scholar named Andrew Butterfield, that uh, this is Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, we're uh, possibly seeing him at the age of, say, 16 or 17 years old, posing, as apprentices often pose for their masters, um, and it does appear that perhaps uh, Verrocchio um, used this handsome youth um, as his model for David, uh, for this uh, bronze that he did. Uh, which then leads me to the question of what Leonardo looked like. This is probably the only image that everyone, all Leonardo scholars, would unanimously accept um, is Leonardo da Vinci, um, done by one of his faithful uh, friends and apprentices, Francesco Melzi, when Leonardo was probably in his early 60s. So he looks very good for early 60s, obviously, took care of himself, 
um, and may actually have touched it up. Uh, Kenneth Clark, the great Leonardo scholar, thinks uh, that it, he may, Leonardo might actually have touched this up. And of course, it's done in Leonardo's uh, red chalk, his uh, medium of choice. Uh, the descriptions that we have of him are interesting. They're almost unanimous in extolling his personal beauty. Paolo Jovio, who knew him, who met him in Rome in 1513, said he was extraordinarily beautiful. Giorgio Vasari said he was striking and handsome. Vasari never actually saw him. Uh, he lived too late to have met him. Uh, and the Anonimo Gadiano, whoever he is, may have known him, and he described how he's attractive, well-proportioned, etc. Giovanni Paolo Lomazzo did not know him, but also gave this description of how beautiful he was. And Walter was describing yesterday Leonardo's very unique fashion sense. Uh, Leonardo had a shapely leg, apparently, and liked to wear the short, uh, uh, the, the short tunic that would show, it, uh, show off his pink tights. Um, and of course, he, um, as Walter referred to, was denounced in April of 1476. Uh, for the crime of sodomy, which was a crime in Florence at that time. It was um, often the authorities looked the other way. Uh, prosecutions were, uh, you really were only prosecuted after a third offense, in which case you were put, effectively put in stocks. Um, but Leonardo was accused of uh, performing acts with Jacopo Saltarelli, who seems to have been a kind of male prostitute, very, or else a very promiscuous young man. The char a second charge came through from the same anonymous person, this time written in very elegant Latin. So no one knows who this was. He never appeared, he or she never appeared, and so Leonardo got off. And he might also have beaten the charge because of the fact that one of the other people named um, was a, also named Leonardo, but his surname was Tornabuoni. And the Tornabuoni were a very powerful family in Florence, and so they may have pulled strings to get the charges dropped. Um, in any case, the, this denunciation did not hurt him. Some people sometimes say that he left Florence because of the fact uh, that the, the, he, of the shame of this. There's no indication Leonardo felt any sort of shame about this. And in fact, it did not hurt his career because in 1478, he got a very prestigious commission in Florence, which was do, to do an altarpiece for a chapel in the town hall. So the town hall, hall fathers asked him to do this altarpiece. Bafflingly, he did not complete it. Um, and it was completed by someone else. And then a year or two, or a couple of years after that, in 1481, he got another equally prestigious commission, which was the Adoration of the Magi. Uh, his father probably pulled some strings to help him get this one. It was for a band of, uh, of Augustinian friars outside the gates of Florence at San Donato a Scopetto. He began it with great eagerness but suddenly abandoned it. He probably meant to go back to it. He said art is never finished, only abandoned, but I think he always planned to go back to these abandoned works, but never quite got back to this one. Uh, because of course, um, soon after 1481, he disappears from Florence and he went to Milan. Leonardo had a number of missing years or missing months between September 1481 and April of 1483. It's not known where he was. But by April, he was in Florence in 1481, and in April of 1483, he arrived in Milan. So at the age of 30, probably sometime in 1482, he would have turned 30 that year, um, he went north to Milan, 200 miles north, um, and uh, began seeking work there. He was part, there are stories about why he went. One story is that Lorenzo de' Medici, the grandson of Cosimo, sent him there as a musician with a lyre. Leonardo da Vinci was a great musician. He designed musical instruments and apparently played very effectively. And so his musical talents may have been what sent him to Milan. Um, and who he wanted to work for was the Duke of Milan, Lodovico Sforza, the uh, de facto duke. He was, had ruled since 1481. He was really a usurper. He'd usurped his young nephew. A thoroughly unscrupulous character, treacherous, untrustworthy, faithless, and yet he was someone that Leonardo felt that he could work for because Leonardo really wanted to work for a prince at a court rather than for monks and wool merchants in Florence. And so Milan seemed to be the place because of the fact that Lodovico, Milan had 100,000 people. It was at least double the size of Florence. And so uh, Leonardo seemed to think that his fortunes were going to be there. And he, as uh, Walter referred to, he made a, um, a, C, a kind of curriculum vitae, a resume of what he could do. 
um, and, and what he claimed to have expertise in. It's sometimes called world's first CV, and like many subsequent CVs, it somewhat exaggerates his abilities. Um, and because he's describing things here that he has at best extremely limited experience with and at worst absolutely no experience whatsoever. Um, and, but he's clearly trying to redefine himself, reinvent himself. He doesn't want to paint, he wants to become an engineer, a kind of military engineer building weapons of mass destruction or a kind of civil engineer, something like that, working on grand public projects for one of the greatest princes in Europe. Um, and, of course, only at the end, as he say, he can carry out sculpture in marble, bronze, and clay, and in painting can do any kind of work as well as any other man, whoever he may be, which is actually not true. Because there was one, and I'll talk about this tomorrow when I talk about the Last Supper, there was one crucial type of painting he could not do, and then, of course, in a few years he was going to be asked to do um, in the uh, refectory of Santa Maria della Grazia. Anyway, despite the plans that he's of building weapons of mass destruction. The first thing he gets is not building a giant cannon or anything like that. It's doing an altarpiece for a confraternity. Um, in a very, it's a very prestigious commission in Florence. He's going to be working with two brothers, the De Predis brothers, uh, one of whom, uh, Giovanni Ambrogio, is the uh, ducal painter. Uh, but the ducal painter is trumped by Leonardo because the contract specifies that this central panel, there are wings to it, but the central panel, is, the contract says, is to be done by the Florentine. And so Leonardo's reputation obviously preceded him, and he's going to do the most important part of this. And Luke, I think in the next hour or later this morning, is going to be discussing this work of art and its relation to, uh, to the one in the National Gallery in London. So I won't say anything more about it, apart from the fact that Leonardo, of course, fell out with the confraternity over it, partly over payment, and partly over the fact that he did not give them what they asked for. They were very specific in their request for what the painting was going to be of, and he moved away from that and did something completely different. And I think that in many ways that's epoch-making in the history of art, because Leonardo is someone who, for whom painting is an exploration. It's something, he's in, his, he works independently of instructions he's given. He did not work to order. A generation before Leonardo, the Duke of Ferrara, Borso d'Este, when he wanted a painting done, he paid by the square foot. Um, Leonardo did not work by the square foot. Um, he worked in a very different style, and I'll talk about that, a little bit about that tomorrow uh, when I discuss the Last Supper. Of course, Leonardo ultimately did get a commission in Florence, but sadly, uh, he was very happy with and was probably much more excited by than the altarpiece, and that was casting the Sforza horse, this grand equestrian monument um, that, that was going to honor the grand, I'm sorry, honor the father of Lodovico Sforza, uh, Francesco Sforza, and he imagined something um, absolutely colossal in scale. There are a couple of versions of it done by the Japanese-American sculptor Nina Akamu, uh, one um, in Michigan, one in Milan. And so you can see how it's going to be an absolute colossus. Uh, the ancient world had not come close to creating something this magnificent. And I'll probably have a bit of time to talk about this um, in a little bit more detail tomorrow. But of course, this dream commission on which he labored for eight or ten years even writing a treatise on equine anatomy to prepare himself for it and experimenting with all sorts of forms of casting. All of that uh, was thrown aside and was for naught in 1494 when war broke out and the 75 tons of bronze that were earmarked for this magnificent colossus were confiscated from him. They're expropriated for military purposes because the King of France, Charles VIII, was crossing the Alps with a fearsome artillery train, and so in times of war, you need bronze not to commemorate previous military victories, um, but rather to ensure future ones by turning that bronze into gunmetal. And that's exactly what happened. And the terrible irony for Leonardo, of course, is that in the 1480s, he was dreaming of making all these weapons of mass destructions, giant crossbows, cannons, cannonballs, etc. Um, and of course, at the moment war finally broke out, he lost his 75 tons of bronze and ended up getting um, a very different commission instead. In 1494, he was given, he, when his wonderful commission of the bronze horse was taken away, he was given another commission, which was to paint a wall in a room um, in a convent where a band of friars ate their lunch every day. And so I think he was less than enthused getting that. 
Once again, I won't say anything more about that because I'll be discussing that, I believe it's tomorrow. Um, but I'll just sum up those years in Milan quickly. He, um, uh, had, he spent 18 years there, and there were 18 very productive years. Um, he was the, became the ducal engineer and worked on all sorts of projects for the duke, very specific things, um, sort of masks and pageants, things like that, for which he was the special effects guy. Crucially, Lodovico, he, he spotted Lodovico well because he decided that what he was going to do was to work for a prince. And Lodovico gave him a salary and gave him, even more crucially, a kind of creative latitude to explore the things that he wanted to explore, such as flight. He began designing flying machines and things like that in those years in Milan. And so he had this wonderful kind of creative explosion in Milan, all of which then, sadly for him, ended in 1499 when King Louis XII of France, um, invaded, who had a claim to the throne of Milan, or the, the Dukedom of Milan, um, crushed Ludovico Sforza, imprisoned him, and Leonardo fled. And so what was left for Leonardo over the next few years was a series of wanderings. Um, he went to Mantua and Venice, touting for business initially. Of course, then ultimately by April 1506, 1500, was back in Florence, and he would remain there until 1406 and work on things like such as the Battle of, uh, of Anghiari. He then went back to Milan when the French were still in control in 1506. He went to Rome in 1513 and spent a couple of years there. Um, and he, uh, during these years, he had a number of, oh, yes, the um, Leonardo was very peripatetic in these years, and he was always writing himself notes for uh, uh, packing, packing up all of his clothing. So I love this one where he's reminding himself, that, you know, so even middle-aged geniuses need to remind themselves to pack their <laughs> spectacles and their nightcap. And, and so he was on the road a lot in those years. Um, but he had a number of great um, uh, people who uh, commissioned things from him in those years. He didn't always or even very often requite their requests, but he worked for the Republic of Florence with his, his ill-fated Battle of Anghiari mural. Um, Isabella d'Este wanted a portrait for him, which sadly he never finished. Uh, one of the French ministers, Flor Florimond Roberté, asked for a Madonna and child for him, which he did complete. Trivulzio, who was an enemy of Lodovico Sforza, a, a Milanese nobleman who became a warlord who worked for the French, wanted an equestrian monument, which of course, reviving that old dream for Leonardo. Cesare Borgia wanted a, uh, him to become his military engineer, etc. And ultimately, of course, Louis XII of France, uh, the conqueror of Lodovico Sforza, wrote, we have need of Master Leonardo da Vinci. Um, Charles d'Amboise, uh, governor of Milan described how he loved Leonardo da Vinci so much. I'm out of time, so I'll just end with um, the uh, fact that, of course, the most famous commission he got in these years wasn't for one of these aristocrats, generals, princes. It was for a um, merchant in Florence, and that was, of course, the Mona Lisa, which Martin is going to be talking about on the last day. And his last patron then was King Francois I of France, who reiterated, uh, repeated the kind of praise that continually um, Leonardo, was showered on Leonardo da Vinci by all of these people. So the young man from Vinci, the boy from Vinci, made good and died according to legend, according to a legend that, of course, um, as uh, Walter pointed out last night, is not true, um, uh, died in the arms of the King of France. Uh, so we'll just end on that note with um, Leonardo going from this sort of Im a very modest lifestyle in Vinci to um, being at all of these courts um, with, with his genius universally recognized. If you saw in what Charles d'Amboise was saying about him, it was that he was recognized for his painting, but he had all of these other talents as well. Anyway, Martin is going to uh, come up and now and fill in various of the blanks, particularly uh, with his scientific efforts. And then we'll have, if this time, we'll have a couple of questions at the end. Thank you. Um, Ryan, could we take the lights down to the uh, point we agreed? Leonardo's science technology, this is not going to be a list or a survey, but I say it's picking out some landmarks to give you a flavor of what Leonardo was doing um, in relation to the biographical framework which 
Ross has very ably, ably sketched out. Um, Leonardo, essentially from Florence, the, his father was a Florentine citizen, and the male members of the Vinci family were Florentine citizens. They uh, practiced law and land management. Um, Leonardo was called Leonardo de France for the most part in Milan and in Rome and wherever he went, or he was called Leonardo di Ser Piero da Vinci. He was openly known by his father's name, even though Ill illegitimate. In Florence, he stands in this extraordinary tradition, which Ross has already mentioned, a tradition of artist engineers in Tuscany, Siena in particular, and Mariano Tacola, who probably few of you will know about, was a very famous figure, Francesco Di Giorgio, Leonardo's Sienese contemporary. He owned a manuscript by Francesco, and above all, Filippo Brunelleschi, the architect of the dome. Um, there are just one point I'd make beyond uh, what Ross said about it was that the engineers were incredibly prestigious. These were the big stars of the practical world. Uh, the death mask there you see on the right is rather a gruesome object, but the fact it's made at all is important because it's a Roman practice. They knew the Romans made death masks of famous people, so um, this indicates that. It was used as the basis by Bugiano for the memorial bust you see on the right there of, um, of Filippo Brunelleschi. In the inscription, he's compared to Daedalus, again picking up this uh, theme which Ross mentioned, uh, challenging the Greeks' anti antiquity. And he's called a divino ingenio. That's an astonishing thing to be called. A divine, not quite a genius, but of supreme talent. Uh, it's anachronistic translation, but here is a divino ingenio. We think of Leonardo Michelangelo as divine artists and referred to at the time, but Brunelleschi was, was there first. In looking at Leonardo Science and Technology, I'm less going to be looking at this tradition, which we're undoubtedly going to be studying during the course of the, uh, of the proceedings here, uh, but more where did Leonardo extend it? What, in, ter in terms of his activities in science and technology, was essentially different and new? Um, the ground base is obviously the people we've already seen. Here, the slide, basically a uh, slightly revised version of, uh, of Ross's slides, um, the two lifting mechanisms, the revolving crane and the hoist, and the ball of Santa Maria del Fiore. We know it was pieced together from triangular sections which were then soldered. Um, a major, major technical feat and indicates um, uh, Verrocchio's skill in, the, in these particular areas. Um, where did he differ from the artists and the scientists. The artists had their geometry of perspective. The uh, engineers had skills and they knew how things worked. What Leonardo did was to bring theory. He brought geometry. He brought mathematics into this area of, pra of practical pursuits. Um, a sheet I particularly like, which just gives you a visual key as to Leonardo's universality and also his restlessness, but also how things relate together. Um, this, we began the Leonardo show at the Victoria and Albert Museum. We began with this, what Carlo Prudetti called the theme sheet. Big double-folded sheet, but rather rare to find one this size, with a mass of things going on. Geometry, the first thing down on the sheet, and there's incise lines you can't see. Uh, there's a naturalistic study of a, of a reed or rush of some sort. There are studies of clouds, there are studies of optics. Uh, there's little bits of engineering. Uh, there's a man, a very typical uh, profile of one of Leonardo's rather belligerent looking men that uh, came up in his imagination again and again. And the draperies of that man fuse with the tree. The branches of the drapery merge with the tree. And this, as we will see, is a, is a continual theme in Leonardo's work that related systems, say, of folding and branching are not seen as unique to the area within which they occur, but they have a universality to them. And behind the man's shoulder, there is a geometrical, uh, a, a curved cone, and that then metamorphoses into mountains. And this is absolutely typical of Leonardo. He has lateral thinking to a pathological degree. It is just extraordinary. 
Uh, it's a great delight and a great joy and a great wonder to watch, but also for any student of Leonardo, it's also frustrating. And I'm sure Walter would have shared this and did mention it. Um, there's, a, there's this frustration about um, his inability to stay with any single thing. Basically, it was he didn't recognize any single thing as being a single thing at all. Um, uh, and underpinning it all, simple geometry. What he's looking for is to get awesome complexity out of simple causes. The Vitruvian man that Walter's going to be speaking about, the man inscribed in a square and a circle. Vitruvius doesn't incidentally say these two things should be done at the same time. They're separate propositions for him. And he's exploring two systems of proportion, a geometrical one, which relies upon straight edge and compass, and an arithmetical one, uh, um, at arithmetical proportions like Pythagorean music. So there are two different proportional systems working here. And that relationship between geometry and arithmetic was going to be of uh, continuing concern. He was not particularly good at arithmetic. He had rudimentary algebra, but was a genius at geometry. Um, indeed, his uh, geometrical education came to a fore in Milan in the 1490s. Luca Pacioli the mathematician, the great student of classical mathematics, great student of Euclid, um, arrived in Milan in 1496, and he asked Leonardo to illustrate his book, this is Luca Pacioli's book, on the five platonic solids, the five regular solids, the five solids, the faces of which are the same, uh, 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 are the same uh, shaped, uh, Simple, simple bodies. Here you've got a dodecahedron, which is a polyhedral body of pentagons, which is then truncated, i.e. the corners have been sliced off. And Leonardo devises a way of showing this both solid and in fenestrated version as a series of windows. This was printed in 159 in Florence, and the, the one on the right, this is the same body, but it's now got pyramids, or technically prisms, erected on its faces. Um, simple geometry in a way, but it goes beguilingly complicated and very, um, very beguiling and very seductive results. For Leonardo, geometry is solid. He sees geometry as a kind of visual sculpture. He can do it in three dimensions. He solves problems better in 3D than he does flat. And when the human uh, engineer, the human maker, the human fabricator comes to build anything, these are the principles on which you work. If you're designing a circular temple, which Leonardo is doing on the right, and he calls it a tempio, a temple, not a church, in emulation of the ancient circular temples, you take the Vitruvian man, these basic schema, and you then permutate them in a way which gives this uh, very complicated and an ingenious form. I mean, anyone who's been to St. Peter's, St. Peter's via Bramante, his colleague in Milan, is a, is an answer, is a descendant from uh, these Florentine centralized church designs. And Leonardo, incidentally, the first person to do plans and solid uh, images in this way, to, to realize the plastic potential of um, architectural design. In Milan in the 1490s, in the 1480s, 1490s, this is when Leonardo's great intellectual explosion occurs. He's in a court post. He's got some kind of salary. He's housed well. He's able to develop his own abilities. And in a court context, you'll look at, he's in a court context with other engineers, but he's also there with people doing geometry like Luca Pacioli, with great poets and, and so on. So he's in an, a courtly environment in which this kind of intellectual exploration can be, you know, can be managed. Perhaps the most extraordinary of his early batches of science, and that's to be a, a lot lost, but of the surviving ones, of the early of the 1489 skull studies at Windsor, dated on one of the sheets, um, sectioned, sectioned to see how the interior cavities of the skull uh, are placed. If you think sectioned, well, it's obvious, but it wasn't. Nobody had taken a saw, and he must have done this, wasn't he? On his workbench, he must have had a skull, and he's taken a saw and he's sawn through, and he finds the triangular frontal sinus, which nobody had, had seen before. So a wonderful achievement in, um, in, in morphology, in, in bone structure. But what he devotes this to is 
rather different from how we would see studying the anatomy of the skull. What he's looking for are basically proportions, proportions of the skull, where the central pole of the skull is. The, the skull becomes like a temple, doesn't it? Or the temple becomes like a skull, whichever way you look at it. But even beyond that, he's looking for how the brain works, how the eye works. And this is beyond what normal artist's anatomy would do. This is, and Morton spoke about this, this is this fundamental saying, I need to know how everything works. He couldn't think about perspective and the eye without saying, how does the eye work? How does the brain work? And he's using here a very traditional system, medieval ventricular system, where the ventricles, the spaces in the brain, these three flasks, as it were, all perform functions. The first one, the imprensiva, receptor of impressions. The second one, intellect, fantasia, imagination, voluntary, involuntary motion, and the sensus communis, uh, ancestor of our common sense, but meaning in this case where all the senses come together so that the five senses are all correlated and the data, as it were, is put into a coherent interpretation of, of the world. It's rather a surprise to find these very beautiful empirical demonstrations of the anatomy of the skull are actually destined to illuminate this very traditional system of, um, of understanding. Not least, he rigs the system so the eye is the, the foremost sense. He insists all the time, the eye is the way to understand the world. Words are very secondary and other senses very secondary, however important they may be in their own zone of operation. So he's looking to the eye to, to unravel and tease out the, the mysteries of the world. The eye acts as a kind of measuring device. It's a kind of dividers for the the structure of the world. I've collaged this little diagram on the left into the, into the skull, but it, into the eye on the sectioned, sectioned brain. But this is feeding all this very regular geometric information in, extracting it from out there, looking out there, it, there's a sort of chaos of things. Yet Leonardo is looking for the senses and the brain and the eye to extract the basic organization, the basic underlying uh, facts in nature, simple facts which you can then iterate and vary to create enormous complexity. Um, and this, of course, relates to the, geom the geometry of the painter, the geometry of the painter now seen in optical terms and in terms of the operation of the eye. And the Last Supper, um, they've all left by this stage, but um, you, 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 can see, you can see the... The, the geometry rather well. The image on, on the right, there's a round object being looked at from different places around it, and of course it always looks the same size from that. But as you move away at the bottom, so the angles become narrower. And if something is twice as far away, it looks half the size, four, time, four, four steps away, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a rigid proportional law which is governing how we see why somebody at the back of the room, Ryan at the back there, looks proportionately smaller uh, than somebody sitting in the front. This is the kind of proportional system of vision which Leonardo is, is looking at. And on the right, the, uh, the eye as dividers. He later did much more complicated demonstrations of this, but um, this is 1480s, 1490s, and gives a very good idea of the underlying thrust of what he's trying to do. In addition to the eye taking in things, he looks at what happens in the world out there, how complicated but rule-based uh, are the optics which, which stand outside our eye. This is the stuff that we're looking at, a kind of visual music of proportion and, and action. On the left, a ball illuminated through a window, and he's working out the grades of light and shade proportionately. And it's all about proportions. Of course, he, he knows it's continuous, but he's blocking it out in terms of, um, in terms of, of, of steps to in, illustrate the basic law. Um, and on the right, this, it's easy with a ball. It's more complicated with a human head. Um, this is a lovely, lovely demonstration of light hitting a profile. And he explains that if you strike a surface, and this is a theory of percussionic, of percussion, of light as a particulate matter, in a way, is exercising force. 
If you hit direct down at right angles, it's terrifically powerful. If you hit at 45 degrees, it's half as powerful, 33 degrees a third, and so on. So there's a proportional law of light and shade happening there. He's not just content with looking at an object and imitating its light and shade. He wants to understand how does the grading work. And it's a very physical law. As I say. It's, it's percussione. And it's exactly the same as driving a nail into a plank of wood. If you hit it straight down, it goes down well. If you hit it at an angle, it doesn't. Um, it, it's a mechanical law of vision. So you can see the kind of unity he's getting. When you look at the pictures, in, on the right, you've got at the top of that page a series of three balls in a box or a chamber, whatever you like to see it as. The light's coming top right, hitting the far wall, and then hitting the bottom of the, uh, on the side of the balls. So this is all percussione by rebound. Uh, this is not direct light. And if you look in the Cecilia Gallerani, the, uh, in the Duke's mistress, look under her chin. Look at the edge of her hand. Look at the ermine's coat. You see this uh, percussion of rebounded light. Um, Florentine painters didn't much do this much. Florentine painters like light to be a kind of plaster of light and shade on a thing, not a, not a, not a life of its own. Leonardo gives life an light and independent light in the, in the space um, in which it, which it occupies. And later, this is Bill Gates's Codex Lester, which with Zameka Lorenza, who you'll be hearing from later, we're doing, well, we've finished an edition of it and are now waiting for Oxford University Press to get going on it. Um, but here he's looking at a phenomenon which is known as the Lumen Cinereum, the ashen light of the moon, which Galileo is credited with discovering. But he explains uh, that and you can see the figure of the actual setup of the sun on the right, um, the, the, moon, the moon and the earth. He explains that this glimmer of light in a new moon, not the crescent, that's just direct light, little sliver of direct light, but if you look in the shaded part of the moon, you can see this glimmer of reflected light. So this is like Cecilia Gallerani. It's like what's happening there. But he goes beyond this, and he says that the eye actually sees the light, the bit at the top of the Lumen Cinereum as lighter because it's against the blackness of the void. And where it's against the brightness of the, of the, uh, of the sickle shape of the, the new moon, as it approaches that, it looks darker. And this is serious because it means that it's not just the optical phenomenon, but Leonardo is saying, how do we see? What is the illusion here? We all know that we can see bright things against dark things, and they look very vivid. Red against green looks very vivid. Blue against yellow looks very vivid. And he looks at these edge effects. Um, and this is part of the subjective element of how the eye judges things. And he's the first person I know who actually says about a scientific phenomenon, we need to know both what the phenomenon is out there, what are the optics, but you also need to know what, what's the eye doing with it. The eye has to be factored in. And he does this in his paintings. A detail from the Virgin of the Rock second version, I think the first version earlier doesn't do it in this pronounced way, where he enhances with exaggeratedly light paint, dark against light, and the shoulders of, um, of the Virgin and St. Anne in the Louvre painting and as you move down behind her back, so there's an exaggerated light contrast. Some artists do this brilliantly. Vermeer was very good at it. Um, on the whole, many artists put down the light and shade, but they don't enhance the effect in this particular way. And the other aspect, which we can relate back to the skulls, and we can take those as a springing off point for what Leonardo is doing, is what, I, 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 what he calls il concetto dell'anima, of the figures. The purpose of the mind, or indeed even the purpose of the soul. In a narrative painting like The Last Supper, what happens in the mind and how does it get into the body? Um, he devises a system of neurological plumbing by which impulses come into the brain from outside but are coursed out into the distal parts of the limbs when you're reacting. One of you will betray me. Is it I, Lord? 
Um, this is terrible. Uh, so he devises a brachial plexus, the complex here, as a system by which these impulses may get down. He says in this one, questo di dimostrazioni, he calls these dem demonstrations, questo dimostrazioni is as necessary for good draftsmen as is the declension of Latin words for the good grammarian. Uh, that's, that's not actually the quote you see there, if anyone who's trying to check, track that, it's a quote further down on the page. But for most artists, this wouldn't matter, providing they got the superficial effects right. But for Leonardo, he needs to know what is driving all this. And uh, you can see, looking at St. James the Greater and the brachial plexus, you can get a, an intuition as to the machinery, the mental machinery that he sees as lying behind this. And we can't just look at Leonardo in the surface and say this is storytelling. This is also about the operation of the human body, human psychology, and indeed the human soul. Um, engineering. Um, the, one of the great aspects of Leonardo's engineering is he wants to bring laws to bear upon the structure. He obviously does a lot of these traditional things, which I call visual boasting. These are the sort of things you show patrons. Uh, Ross has showed that letter, the prospectus he did of what he could do. The scythe chariots of a Roman, very antique in style, and he knew that. So if you could kill people stylishly, it um, appealed to patrons more than uh, <laughs> doing it in a, a non-antique manner. And of course, the, the, the famous uh, so-called tank. Incidentally, he's got the, the cams and the lantern gears there and one of the wheels the wrong way round. And if you, turn the, if you turn the cams, the wheels would work in opposition to each other. So even Leonardo makes mistakes. But what is important to me, or what is important in historically about Leonardo's engineering, is he does theory. If he's looking at how a bow works, he tries to work out what are the dynamics of the bow, what are the statics of the bow. The sheet in the Christchurch in uh, Oxford on the left, he's thinking, if I built an experiment, either in my mind or real, about bow and how far you pull a bow back, what weight is needed, you could do it with a pulley system. Or on the right, he's trying to extract a proportional law of how far you pull back and what force you impart the, uh, to the missile, to the projectile, to the arrow. He decides, for reasons too complicated to go into in this short talk, that it, the, the projection, the force of the projection of the arrow is proportional to the angle subtended by the bowstring when it's pulled back, that central, central angle. Kind of smart. Um, and look, at, he designs parts of machines. He's the first person who designs elementi, as he calls them, of machines. Not complete machines, but things which can be adapted. One of them is a gear for equalizing the force in a barrel spring. In the barrel there, there's a spring, and as you all know, a, a spring occupies, exercises less force as it winds down. So. If you're wanting a regular force, as is essential for a clock, <clears throat> um, no pendula. There's no way of relating, regulating the unwinding down. So he has to devise a gear which compensates for the diminishing force. And the force diminishes pyramidally. That's to say it goes proportionately down from 1 to 2 to naught in, a, in that, that way. So he devises gears to compensate for this, wonderful compact gears, um, a helter-skelter gear and a volute gear. And it's based upon the theory of the diminution of, of force. Um, incidentally, the mechanical drawings are just amazing in terms of how they demonstrate machinery. The, the helter-skelter gear on the right, he does a cutaway of the axle. And this, which is a... Uh, a hoist with two ratchets, a very innovatory hoist, um, he does it as an exploded diagram. He pulls the bits apart. How do you demonstrate two ratchets? You pull it apart so you can say, ah, I can see how that works. Um, the exploded diagram is another one of his inventions. And at the heart of this is this common notion of the search for the proportional powers of nature. And this is a, an abstract diagram on the left uh, which shows just that proportional relationship of a quarter to a half to three quarters to the whole. In gravity, it works in reverse. In most powers, diminish. Um, but it's a universal applicant. 
And there there's the geometrical diagram of optics of looking at a sphere again, which works in exactly that way. So we may say these machines have a perspective of a force. They work perspectively in terms of diminution. So you can see the way in which uh, these things are not separate for Leonardo. A machine, a gear is not separate from perspective. They're, they're part of the same mental field. Uh, in the, uh, it, we now move to Florence and a, a big Florentine project, a major Florentine project for the Arno Canal. Um, how long have I got? Uh, about 13 minutes. Okay, good. Um, that's still on track, more or less. <laughs> With any luck. Um, Leonardo was involved in a disastrous scheme to divert the Arno around Pisa during wartime, but this is not this scheme. This is a long standing Florentine scheme to bridge the or bypass the unnavigable bit of the Arno. Florence had no reliable access to the sea, which for a a significant power was a serious problem. And he devises in this extraordinary map, this is what I call the, map, the Jackson po Pollock of the map maker's art. Um, let, maps always live for Leonardo. They're never inert things. They're never just uh, um, Automobile Association in Britain maps of, of roads. And he devises this great arching canal which goes from Florence, um, uh, uh, Pistoia, Luca in this great arch. You think, this is crazy, you know, why doesn't he do a simpler one? But if you look at the A11, the Autostrada, it follows exactly that route. He's got his geography right. There's no point in blasting through Montalbano and uh, completely uh, imposs impossible reasons. Uh, it's a tribute to his acuity of looking at the landscape, but while he's looking at this landscape, he sees how the rivers have cut through mountains, have cut through the earth, revealing strata of what we would call fossils. He calls them niki, he calls them, uh, he calls them uh, shells. And he decides that the evidence looking at these strata is there must have been multiple inundations of the earth, and indeed some of them lasted a long time. It wasn't the biblical deluge, which is too quick. These creatures wouldn't, wouldn't have lived for years and years and years in these colonies on, in these strata. So he decides the earth must have an ancient history of extraordinary depth. He even thinks at one point in the future, the Mediterranean will drain out as the Straits of Gibraltar get wider and it will become the Nile. Um, it's probably not right, but it's an indication of the radical nature of, of Leonardo's, Leonardo's vision. In Florence itself, he says, well, I'll leave you to read that because I can't read it from, from this angle. Uh, but he decides that at one time, what we now see as the Arno Valley, there was a great lake in the area where Florence is, another great lake where Arezzo is on the other side of the mountains that separate the lower and upper, upper Arno. So uh, if you'd gone back to prehistoric times, you would have found the sea came up to uh, much closer to Florence with a sort of drop of the, of the river into, into the sea, and then you'd have these two great prehistoric lakes. An astonishing vision. Um, you can put that quote beside Mona Lisa, and you've got the two lakes. This is not a literal illustration. I'll be saying a lot more about this in my Mona Lisa lecture, but you can see how canalization ends up in Mona Lisa. With Leonardo, you can always get from one point to another point, normally with one degree of connection. Um, looking in detail at the water, um, these are very remarkable drawings of water in motion. This is a great synthetic assembly, the, the lower diagram, based upon a whole series of studies of water. But working on the Bill Gates Codex, um, Domenico and I have been looking at these little diagrams there, which, are, uh, which show an experimental tank. He says, get the ceramicist to make this with ceramic and glass sides. So he's got an experimental laboratory tank to see what happens. Um, and you can see the two of them, Sperientia is the top one he's labeled it, experience or experiment. As far as I know, it's the first time anyone's ever set up uh, an artificial physical experiment to understand how a phenomenon of, of nature, nature works. Um, and in terms of lateral thinking, the old man here, almost certainly I think is St. Joseph, 
was originally on a folded sheet, so he wasn't looking glamly at the complexities of water, which are hurting his mind, but it's quite a nice image. But importantly, uh, the, he compares that motion of the water as these uh, big uh, stakes interrupt and turn the flow into kind of great, so like horses tails of motion. And he compares that with the motion of water. The motion, the weight of the, car, the weight of the hair, the motion of the current, the tendency to curl gives you a helix. And you look in Mona Lisa and again you can see exactly those things happening with the hair, with the drapery and so on. This is a kind of universal field of uh, a phenomena for Leonardo, not a series of, of uh, uh, separate things. Um, in 1517, 1518, he undertook his most dramatic dissection of an old man, the Vecchio, as he calls him, who claimed to be 100 years old. And Leonardo made a dissection to find the cause, as he put it, of so sweet a death, the old man faded away. And he comes up with a series of images which come out of that dissection. Um, on the left, the, the, the left of those three, he's comparing the heart to a seed and saying that the heart is the origin of the vascular system because it's like a seed and it sends its roots into the dung of the liver. This was of some consequence at the time because there was a tradition arguing that the liver was the source of the vascular system. So he shows a nocciolo, a nut or a seed, say a pit, a peach stone, and he shows, um, uh, and then he shows on the other side the uh, heart with the with the liver, as if the liver is to be the origin. So he settles the argument by analogy, and analogy is key for Leonardo. He decides with the old man that the old man had died because of the silting up of his blood system, and the little inset diagram in the centre one shows the veins and vessels of the young straight and coursing and very efficient, and the uh, vessels of the old which become tortuous. And he knows as an engineer of canals that if you have tortuosity, you have meanders, you get silting up and erosion, um, and ultimately the system fails. And he decides that the old man's system had basically become silted up. And then on the right, a kind of philosophical excursus, the little sketch of the human figure there, He's envisaging all the veins and all the organs in isolation as a single study, and he calls it the albero delle vene, the tree of the vessels. Um, this, is, this gives a visual sense of how he felt the vene d'acqua in the body of the earth. He uses that term repeatedly in the Codex Lester and elsewhere. The rivers of the earth, underground and superficial, are vene d'acqua. They are vessels or veins of water. And you can just visually, without me elaborating it, get the sense of how this analogy is. This is the Arno and Mugnoni, um, west of Florence. And not least, was he's always looking for laws, um, the branching in the human body and the branching in the natural world obey the same rules. The rule being, stating it acronymically, Acronist, acron, can't say that, and in a non-time, in an, an ahistorical manner, is, um, is that the cross-sectional area at each point in the system should equal, be equal to every other cross-sectional area, so the trunk, the cross-sectional area, should equal that of the, of the branching system. So always a rule. He always wants a rule, a mathematical rule, a law to come come out of this. This rule basically was reinvented by Bernoulli in the 17th century. And the culmination of this, we don't have a drawing of a man in this case, but of a woman, um, the irrigation and um, uh, the irrigation systems of the human body uh, showing the whole thing as a microcosmic, as a little model of the earth. He would look at this and say, the human body is a microcosm, it's a model of the Earth as a whole. The processes, the systems, the branching, etc., are all part of a, a single, single system. But as you go in, you see mathematics applied to the details, these tricuspid valves, three cusp valves in the aorta of the heart. This, as Francis Wells has demonstrated conclusively, is, is an ox heart, which he dissected with supreme brilliance. Um, and he thinks about how does this valve work? And he decides it's a passive valve. 
It works because of the vortices in the constricted neck of the aorta. And in the top right of the sheet, and again, this is a great innovation in method, he says, has a model made in glass. And Maury Garib at Tal Caltech phoned me one day when I was actually at Princeton and said, uh, I'm making Leonardo's heart model in glass. Do you want to come? Um, I, I was there double quick. And as you can see, using modern imaging techniques, that's Maury's model there. It's not got the valves in at this point, but you can see the vortices curling back. And these are the ones that fill the cusps before the next pump of blood. Um, again, the building of a model to prove to be a, a test of nature, a prover of nature is, is astonishingly original. And finally, the, one of the great achievements around 1510 a series, of, uh, a series of demonstrations of muscles and bones. Never really surpassed, but not just muscles and bones. He works out, how do you show this best? You can lift off a muscle. All this very complex area here, do it in wires. So you can see how all the pulling and tugging and stretching and so on goes on in that uh, wire, wire demonstration. Um, more of the arms, an exploded arm at the... Uh, uh, set two down where he's pulled out the bone to show how it goes into the into the shoulder socket and then thinking about the the system here he does a diagram he does a diagram of how the head is kept upright on this mast and he says it's like a ship you've got the mast of a ship and a series of stays and he does it at the bottom there as a geometrical diagram um, once more a very innovatory way of thinking about anatomy we may be used to things being demonstrated as mechanics in the human body, but uh, not in Leonardo's time. And looking also at the anatomy of animals, he's so interested in flight, he looks at a bird's wing. On the, on the right of that screen, I flipped over the drawing of the, of the arms just to make the parallel closer. And he looks at a bird's wing, he says, that's an arm. And the bit on the top there, he says that's a thumb. He calls it a thumb. So he thinks, well, if I'm going to build a flying machine, then I should be, in remaking nature, which is his ultimate aim, I should be looking at an anatomical system for this, a system which imitates, doesn't copy, but has the principles of how a bird flies, how a bat flies. And this is the flying machine that we built for the Hayward Gallery show many years ago, and this was a flapping machine. We knew it wouldn't fly, but we wanted to get a certain kind of organic feel to it. Um, for the a television series called Leonardo's Dream Machines, we made a hang glider using Leonardo's wing design, quite an early one on the left. Um, Sky Sports, not to be confused with the British program that makes film, uh, that, uh, that uh, TV program that uh, con concentrates on sport. But Sky Sport in Bedfordshire, who, who organise um, and restore ancient planes, um, built this wing. It gave absolutely formidable lift. Uh, Judy Ledden, the hang glider pilot champion, flew it on the Sussex Downs, and it had to be held down with ropes so she didn't disappear off into the sea. Um, there, there it is. It's, it's flying there, or at least it's suspended there in... Um, in the foyer of the Victoria and Albert Museum for the Leonardo show we did there. So this is remaking nature. Mona Lisa is remaking nature. It's not a photographic picture in that sense. Um, so ultimately, the Mona Lisa and the flying machine are the same kind of thing. Thank you. Bravo.